Charlotte. And I'm Dina. Welcome to the Grim Curriculum. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Before we get into this week's very heavy episode, we do want to just remind you that our live show is only three freaking weeks away. What Holy the heck? crap. Time is fucking <laughs> flying, and oh we're almost at December. Our live show is December 9th. That is a Saturday at Felice Cafe here in Edmonton. Tickets are on sale on Eventbrite, and yeah, it's our very first live show. We will be doing a live episode of the podcast for everybody in person. I think I've said in person like 10 times, but you get the idea. <laughs> because we are live in person, so you've exactly. got to come out, and it's all for charity, Zoe's animal rescue society to be specific it's for the puppies it's for the kitties and it's going to be an amazing amazing time so come on out yes absolutely and we'll have a few merch items there as well so if you haven't had your chance to get your hands on some stuff from our etsy some stickers and keychains and that kind of thing they will be there too so we hope to see you out it's going to be a good time we're very excited a little nervous but very excited we got this all right so Last week's episode was a very fun one. I have to say, it's probably one of my favorite old-timey episodes that we've ever covered. Elmer McCurdy was quite a character. You know, I got some uh, feedback from my mom about that one, actually. Oh, let me hear it. I can't uh, wait. Yes, so she told me that she was listening to it with her headphones in, and she was just, like, laughing to herself so much. <laughs> and that just, like, makes me so happy. She's like, I couldn't believe this guy. He was crazy. I was like, I know. It's He really was. Crazy in life, crazy in death, and we love it. And today's episode... Is going to be the complete opposite of the somewhat joyful but morbid ride that that was. We really wanted to cover something lighter hearted before we start this new series. Yes, because the next few weeks are going to be just as rough for us as they are for you, dear listeners, aren't they? Yeah, we don't cover cults often. And actually, in fact, this is only the second time we've covered a cult on the show. Om Shinrikyo being the first cult we covered. Praise be to the bathwater. Gives me the heebie-jeebies just know. thinking about it. Today, we are starting our series on Rock Terrio and the Ant Hill Kids. Self-proclaimed surgeon, father of many, torturer, murderer, and cult leader. This French-Canadian, who claimed he was raised by a bear, is responsible for the deaths of multiple people, including infants. We don't want to give too much away here, but trust us, this series might just ruin your entire day. Most cults are disturbing, but this one is by far one of the worst in modern history. Yeah, there's not a lot of terrible things that this guy didn't do. He he really checks off the cult leader checklist. He does. I almost feel like we need to take a deep breath before we go on this journey together, because holy shit, it's gonna be rough. Yep, now would be your time uh, to pause this episode and go grab yourself a hot chocolate and your blankie because you're going to need some comfort, I think. Or like a Rubik's Cube or something to just distract you because it's going to be rough. Like, we both have a lot of feelings about this one. I wrote a paper on Rock Terrio in university and my professor fucking hated it and I do <laughs> not blame him. <laughs> yeah, 100%. That being said, there's so many parts of this story that they make me feel absolutely ill, like physically yeah. ill. It's truly vile. We've covered evil people on the show quite a few. I mean, that's our thing. We, it's what we do. But our guy Rock, like he is next level cruel. Yeah, if you're not familiar with Canada at all and you think being Canadian automatically makes you a nice person, then unfortunately you have been fooled by this stereotype because this case covers a wide variety of fucked up things as one would usually expect from a cult but rock terrio was genuinely one of the worst people to walk this earth so many leaders of famous cults have their members commit violence on their behalf charles manson and again even shoko asahara come to mind however rock stands out because he was more than happy to be the one inflicting punishments and that is something that he would do often and severely. There is a lot of torture and semen in this story. He loved every minute of it and saw nothing wrong with mutilating members and even beating children to death. 
But on the other hand, he was this amazing, charismatic guy that you just couldn't help but like. He came across as very entertaining, often making entire rooms full of people just laugh at his jokes or his skits. That's right, because he was a cult leader that liked putting on skits. He was so good at getting people to like him that he would not only be able to manipulate the members of his cult, but he would sway the opinions of social workers and psychologists with surprising ease. There's evil, and then there's Rock Terrio. Are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. So we'll start with the early life of Rock as we usually do. He was born on May 16th, 1947 in Saguenay, Quebec. Which, fun fact, is apparently a sister city to Camrose, Alberta. I had no clue. I had no clue either, so that's going to be a piece of knowledge that's now taken up space in my brain. (laughs) So useful. His parents, Hyacinth and Pierrette, had a total of seven children. We don't know a lot about his mother, but by all accounts, it seems like she was a pretty average lady. His father, on the other hand, was a different story. Hyacinth was a bit of a religious nut, and this would affect the lives of the entire Terrio family. But that wasn't all that would stand out about his early years. They were not wealthy by any means and lived a typical farmer lifestyle for the time. This involved Rock learning many lessons from his father during his childhood. One of which was the art of castration, which to me sounds like a cannibal corpse album. (laughs) I love that. That's right. So Rock and his dad spent many a day castrating pigs, and apparently he had quite a knack for it. And that's going to come in very handy for him as an adult. So unfortunately, we're going to be bringing that back up again later. There will be a lot of chopping off slash removal of body parts in this story. His father was physically abusive to Rock and led the house with an iron fist. Which for late 1940s parenting, I feel is pretty par for the course. Exactly. There's plenty of young French-Canadian farmer kids who grew up with some sort of physical abuse, but they didn't become cult leaders who would inflict absolute torture on their victims. It's interesting to note that as an adult, Rock would often tell very exaggerated tales and often straight up lies about how awful his childhood was. He realized that it was a very effective way to get sympathy from people, which in turn would make it easier for them to like him. It also made him more relatable to people who had undergone their own experiences with trauma. And he would use this to his advantage in a huge way. He also lied about his overall state as a child, saying that he grew up with an array of developmental and health problems, which was entirely not true. It's interesting to me that he lied about things that made him appear weaker rather than stronger. He knew that if he had the sympathy of someone, it was easier to gain their trust or at least get them to give you like less of a harder time. And I will say he does as an adult and as like a full-fledged cult leader, if you will, he's a very intimidating figure. He's this big man with a bald head and a big beard And he very much has sort of this, like, Rasputin look about him to me. Oh, absolutely. He's like a big bear of a man. 100%. Shortly after his birth, the family moved to Thetford Mines, also known as the asbestos capital of Canada. That's where you want to raise a family. It's funny, researching this, I feel foolish, but I didn't actually know that asbestos was something that could be mined. I thought it was a created chemical. I didn't realize it was sort of a naturally occurring thing. You know, that thought didn't even cross my mind, but I guess you're right. Yeah, and like we said, that's exactly what Thetford Mines is known for. It's the asbestos capital. Religion was a huge part of their lives. Hyacinth was a member of the Pèlerins de Michel, which translates to the Pilgrims of St. Michael. They're also known as the Beret Blanc or the White Beret. And I'm so sorry. I've said this so many. My French is garbage, you guys. It's not. Mm -mm. (laughs) It is also a common misconception that Canada is entirely bilingual. It is not. Only certain provinces are. (laughs) I can speak quite a few languages. Just none of them happen to be French. I like I tried in school. Couldn't do it. Well, and I tried in school and then our teacher left and they never rehired another one. So that was the end of my (laughs) French speaking career, unfortunately. We've talked about this before on the show. We have, we have. (laughs) 
The White Beret are a group that aim to promote the idea of a more Christian society, or as they see it, promoting a better world. They do this by holding meetings, handing out religious pamphlets, and praying over people. They also believe in a social credit-based society. Which basically is giving back power to the working class. However, it doesn't seem like that was the actual overall intent of the group. They're definitely more on the conservative side of things, and they are fully devoted to the Pope no matter what. When Rock was a small child, his father would gather the children and take them door-to-door around town. Together, they'd help raise awareness about the work of the White Berets. Hyacinth would preach his heart out while the kids stood there with collection plates. Rock hated this, and it would actually later result in him developing a severe hatred for the White Berets, as well as Roman Catholics. It's important to note that it didn't sway him away from all religion, just the one his father followed. He was a really smart kid and had a very obvious sense of charisma and charm from a very early age. As a child, he was well-liked by both his peers and his teachers. There are some reports of Rock's behavior at a young age that warrant some red flags being raised. One being that he learned how to get what he wanted from anyone. He was shockingly manipulative as a kid, and this is something that would continue on into his adulthood. By around grade 7, Rock began to feel like he had gotten the most he probably could from what one would consider a formal education. So he dropped out of school and began working and dedicating his life to religion. It's hard not to wonder what his life may have turned out like if he had more of a chance at a better education. However, it seems to me like at this point he had already set his educational sights elsewhere. And I thought about it. The idea of a more educated Rock Terrio would be fucking horrifying. We don't want that. No, I think that would honestly take him into supervillain levels of cult leader. And he was already extremely bad as it was. Right, he didn't need to have super smarts. Absolutely not. After he left school, he became even more involved in religion, which began with him committing to teach himself about the Old Testament of the Bible. Parents, if your teenager drops out of school so that they can focus on their obsession with religion, please consider that a huge, huge red flag. I was just talking today about how when you're young and a teenager and you think you know everything and you're convinced that all adults are stupid and that you have it all sussed out, this kid dropped out in grade seven. What is that, like 11 years old, 12 years old? He didn't know shit, but he sure thought he did. Right? He's like, no, I don't need school. I just need religion. Like, I mean, really, I'm not religious. You're not religious. I'm sure some Mm -hmm. of you listening are religious, but we can all agree that's not a good move. No, education is important no matter where you're going in life. (laughs) It was around this time that he began to believe that something terrible was coming. A war. One that would prove to be the ultimate battle between good and evil. The end result of this catastrophic event would be not only death and destruction, but the end of the world as we all know it. In 1967, at the age of 20, Rock married Francine Grenier, She was a sweet girl who lived the next town over. Marrying Rock would be a decision that she would very much regret. Seriously, he was absolutely terrible to her. And to be fair, he would be absolutely awful to all of his wives because, yes, there were multiple. It was around this time that the newlyweds relocated to Montreal. Together, Rock and Francine would have two sons. Rock Sylvain, also known as Rock Jr., who was born in 1969, and Francois, who would be born two years later. Francois would later have the following to say about his relationship with his father. I was so scared of him when I was small. He would say my name and I would tremble like a leaf. In 2009, his sons would publish a book about their experience with their father named The Sons of Moses, a title Rock bestowed upon himself. Giving yourself a nickname is such a dick thing to do, but giving yourself a whole ass title like that, that is never a good sign. Right? I love a good nickname as much as the next person, but a nickname is something that is bestowed upon you by someone else, I feel like. You know, you have to earn it. You can't just give yourself a nickname. Hey guys, I want y'all to call me Viper from now on. It's like, yeah, no, you're gonna get called asshole is what you're gonna get called. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Rock had his share of health issues, 
one of which was ulcers, which caused him a huge amount of pain and irritation. And this didn't exactly make him the most pleasant person to be around. He was often irritable. It would later be said that being around him involved a lot of walking on eggshells and basically just trying not to make him angry. He ended up having multiple surgeries due to the ulcers, one of them being a procedure where part of his stomach was removed. However, there were serious complications that led to further problems with his digestive system, which in turn made him even more difficult to be around. As a result of all these medical issues, Rock developed an obsession with human anatomy and medicine, specifically indigenous medicine practices. Something else to note is that the people around him saw a huge shift in his personality after these surgeries. He developed a severe paranoia about ailments that made no sense and would often tell his family that he would soon die of cancer. So a little bit of a a segue here, but this concept is really interesting to me because I'm obviously not a medical professional. But if we have any listening, I'd like to know your thoughts on this because apparently in some cases, anesthesia can cause things like hallucinations, mania, irritability and shifts in personality long after the surgeries happen. So I just wanted to share something I found from the National Library of Medicine. Long-term consequences of anesthetic exposure in humans are not well understood. It is possible that alterations in brain function occur beyond the initial anesthetic administration. Research in children and adults has reported cognitive and or behavioral changes after surgery and general anesthesia that may be short-lived in some patients, but while in others, such changes may persist. The changes observed in humans are corroborated by a large body of evidence from animal studies that support a role for alterations in neuronal survival or structure and later behavioral deficits at older age after exposure to various anesthetic agents during fetal or early life. The potential of anesthetics to induce long-term alterations in brain function, in particularly vulnerable populations, warrants investigation. I thought that was interesting to note because this isn't like the first time I've heard about something like this happening. And I wonder if now this is pure layman's speculation here. I am also not a medical professional, but I wonder if the really gnarly combination of being in crippling, excruciating pain from these ulcers and Mm -hmm. then having this surgery and perhaps having some sort of brain change due to the anesthetic all sort of worked as a cocktail for awfulness, basically. Yeah, because the first time that he had the surgery, I guess they botched it or something went wrong that caused him even more pain. Afterwards, it would lead to him developing this thing called dumping syndrome, which is basically like the stuff in your stomach when it's turning into poop it gets really really rock solid it gets stuck and it's like excruciating pain oh that's gnarly and then also it sort of changes your belief because a lot of people have well of course this trust in doctors and you go into surgery thinking right I'm going to come out on the other side and I'm going to be better and then when he wasn't I'm sure that does something to your personality Oh, of course. And I mean, for him, the thing that we're going to see later is he's going to be very interested in surgery. So, yeah. Uh, I mean, we can question whether or not the surgeries were responsible for that shift that happened with Rock. Or maybe he was just always destined to be the shitty person he was. Or it could have just been a mix of both of those things. But either way, it's definitely something very interesting to consider. He moved the family back to Thetford Mines, and he joined a Masonic lodge called the Aramis Association. So something about these guys, I tried to get some info on them and what they were all about, but I could only find two different groups that were definitely not this one. Like, they were very different. One was about, like, rheumatism, and the other one was something, I don't know. But these guys, they're basically like our version of Shriners. Ah, okay, gotcha. I mean, the main thing to take away from him joining this group is that he claimed they taught him how to hypnotize people. Of course they did. When Rock wasn't reading about the human body or being awful and mean to his family, he was enjoying another one of his hobbies, woodworking. This part is kind of confusing because some reports say that he made little like knickknacks and like wooden beer mugs and stuff like that, while others say he was a novice cabinet maker. But either way, he was working with wood. 
The family was not doing well financially, and this caused a lot of tension between Rock and Francine. He would boast to anyone who would listen about how successful and rich he was, but in reality, they were flat broke. Rock turned to alcohol around this time to cope with the stress. This escalated into a huge drinking problem, and it probably doesn't surprise anyone that Rock was a very mean drunk. Also, I can't imagine that becoming an alcoholic had great effects on his already very painful digestive system. Oh, exactly. Like That probably wasn't helping the ulcers. It's probably no surprise that he had zero empathy for the people around him. He would only ever do what he wanted, despite how strange or erratic it was. Rock was very rarely concerned with the consequences of his actions. He developed an interest in politics at this time, too. Not in a huge way, but he joined a local committee that was responsible for small-time decision-making on a local scale. This wouldn't last long, though, because the rest of the committee wasn't a huge fan of his and didn't respond well to his suggestions. This personally offended Rock, who stopped coming to their meetings, causing him to lose his spot on the committee. And he was useless, like, they are in, again, it's the asbestos capital of Canada, and one of his suggestions was like, well, why don't we just get rid of the asbestos? Oh, sweetie, that's like going to Fort McMurray and saying, let's get rid of the oil. You're not going to be received well. Right? Eventually, he was able to make some money off of his woodwork, but he would often make the trip out to Quebec City to sell his wares, and this was something that Francine absolutely hated. And we can't really blame her because... It was around this time that Rock got real horny for just about everybody. You heard that right, folks. And Rock's sexual appetite will unfortunately be something that we're going to talk about a fair bit throughout this series. When it came to Francine, he completely switched. He went from wanting her to dress modestly to wanting her to show off as much of her body as possible. You sure do read a lot about his penis when you're looking into this story, don't you? It, an upsetting amount of yep. his wiener comes into question. <laughs> right. I want to point something out to you, though, Charlotte. Mm. In this week's notes, you wrote the words Rasputin-looking-ass motherfucker, which I loved, and I agree. <laughs> but uh, it made me think that was another thing they had in common was penis size. If you believe in that sort of thing, maybe Rock was Rasputin reincarnate because he certainly had a very similar path, but he maybe not sure quite did. as much influence. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever Rock would go to Quebec City, he would meet up with various different women for sex. One of these women was Giselle, who unfortunately for her would become a very large part of Rock's life. Giselle was engaged to be married and Rock obviously had a wife. That didn't stop him from going out of his way to get her to fall in love with him. He love-bombed the shit out of her. He was kind and considerate and very romantic. Rock wrote her poetry and love letters, and it didn't take long before she was wrapped around his finger. It also kind of helped that he told her he had cancer. This guy just gets worse and worse and worse. We're very early into this story already, and already we're like, what a piece of shit. Right, and it's gonna be, like, this is nothing. This is, like, his best years. Honestly. Francine, eventually, she'd had enough and filed for divorce. She took the boys and moved far, far away from Rock Terrio. Giselle and Rock eventually made it official, a decision that, like Francine, Giselle would soon grow to regret. His obsession with religion was at an all-time high, and one of the things he focused on heavily from the Old Testament was the role of women. He would demand submission from Giselle at all times. And like we said, he is a shitty human being up until this point. There's no doubt about that, but he hasn't done anything that comes even close to the kind of stuff he's going to be doing a few years from now because he was awful to Francine, but Giselle would fall victim to him in many, many horrific ways. On one occasion, Giselle, in an attempt to impress Rock, drank a huge amount of alcohol, simply wanting to try and keep up with him. This landed her in hospital with severe alcohol poisoning. In 1974, Rock and Giselle moved to Montreal, where he made money through various thefts and frauds. The next few years were fairly uneventful. Rock made money however he could, and the two lived their lives. In 1977, Rock joined the Thetford Mines sect of the Seven-Day Adventist Church. 
This is something that the church is very ashamed of now. This was certainly not a high point for them. Their focus on health seemed to appeal to him, and it wasn't before long that Rock had actually given up both meat and alcohol to adhere to the rules of his new church, a group that he would very quickly win over. They came to him. A recruiter came to Thetford Mines and met Rock, who loved their idea of a pending doomsday. The only way, they said, to survive was to be deemed worthy. This was a group who lived a life of great dedication and restriction. He would take huge advantage of this. Rock worked his way up through the ranks and found a new role as a recruiter himself. He was very well liked, and those above him took note of his high success rate and charisma. Giselle was soon baptized into the church and would join him whenever he went out to recruit new members. Her presence combined with his charm were really, really good for recruitment numbers. He was essentially kicking ass. This led to more leadership roles from him, one of which was teaching. Something to know about the Seventh-day Adventist church is that they're very, very opposed to smoking. They actually had a course for members to help them quit. It was a five-day course that was guaranteed to end with you never touching another cigarette in your life. Rock was basically handed a captive audience that was highly impressionable. This would prove to be a recipe for disaster. Seriously, though, like this all starts with a non-smoking seminar. It's going to end with amputation by cleaver, tooth extractions, and burnt genitals. And more. (laughs) And you know what the worst part about that is? Hmm. When I was working through the script, I was picking and choosing. I wanted to pick three different things to put in there. And I had to look for so long. Those were like the least awful things that I could find. They really are. If you think, like we said, amputation by cleaver, getting your teeth yanked out and burnt junk is uh, bad enough for you, well, next episode is going to be uh, a whole other roller coaster ride for you. Things are going to get really bad. So I kind of wanted to just like ease us into this. We've established Rock Terrio, not a nice person. Not a nice Canadian. He's developed this charisma. He's learned how to manipulate people. He's already on his second wife. He's gone through alcoholism and surgeries. And now he's sort of got this captive audience. So you can see where this is going. Next episode, we're going to be introducing you to the first members of the Ant Hill Kids and show you how Rock not only found new members, he made them too. And then he proceeded to make all of their lives a living hell. Which is ironic considering how religious he was. (laughs) Right? It's, it really is. I mean, at this point, I'm sure you're all listening, you're thinking to yourselves, wow, this episode really wasn't that bad. And dear listener, you're correct. So part two, when we are talking about how Rock Terrio would make members of the Ant Hill Kids break their own legs with sledgehammers, we want you to remember how lighthearted you all feel right now. Because you're going to miss that feeling. Yeah, very, very much so. He was a very, I watched the Deadly Messiah documentary called Very Bad Men. It's it's interesting because it shows interviews from the people that were kind of around him and stuff. And you can see even years later, the way that they speak of him is they're mystified by him in a way. And the things that he's going to get these people to do, it really does take a certain level of, we say charisma a lot, but it's so much more beyond that. Like, For him to do what he did to these people and convince them to do to others is just beyond me. Well, we've talked about it a lot before with these sort of narcissistic, abusive people where for someone fairly confident in themselves, not all the time maybe, but for the most part, we're pretty happy with who we are. This would not work. We would take one look at Rock Terrio and be like, fuck no. Mm -hmm. But that's the point. They don't go for people that they think will ignore them or brush them off. They go for the vulnerable people and they find their way in through the cracks and then that's when they've got you. And again, they gave him his audience. They gave him these people. They handed them over and we're going to see he's going to roll with it. Yep, he certainly does. All right. So here we are at the outro. Once again, just a quick reminder live show. You heard about it all in the beginning, but December 9th, tickets are available. We have the link posted all over the place. Uh, It will be down in the description below, so please check that out. 
if you're in the area or you don't mind traveling a little further afield, we would love to see your beautiful faces. Yeah, and like we mentioned, it is in a few short weeks, so we are going to be taking next week off to prepare for the live show, so you will not be getting part two next week. It's going to come to you on December the 1st. However, we're still going to be releasing our episode of Extra Credit on schedule, so you'll get to listen to that, and uh, it's going to be a great time. Dina mentioned it before we started recording, but we've been doing this for nearly two years now, and this will be our first time kind of taking a break. We've had some delayed episodes, but I think this will be our first time kind of taking that break to sit and really dedicate some time to the live show so that we can bring you guys the best entertainment you can possibly imagine. And yeah, so we will see you all the week after. Hell yeah, it's going to be great. And before we sign off, it is time for that part of the episode. We want to say a huge thank you and we love you to our grim VIPs and up. A huge, huge thank you to Mayhem Mudkip, Kevinus Musicus, Brian, Hillary, Judy, Atlantean Jedi, Lisa, and Bob. You guys are amazing. Y'all are the Titty City, the Bomb.com, the Cat's Pajamas. You're awesome and we love you. Thank you all so much for listening. This has been The The Grim Grim Curriculum. Curriculum. Dina, I have a very old, old history fact for you today. Bring it on. So we're going to be talking about Mithridates VI, who was a Parthian king in 132 BC. He was so paranoid of being poisoned that he took small doses throughout his life to build up an immunity. But when he was finally captured by the Romans, he tried to kill himself with poison, but he failed because he was immune. Oh, he played himself that one. Poor guy. Poor guy. Bye. Bye.